So I'll tell you what this video is not. This video is not an attempt to, you know, own, own the vegans, epic style. It's not, not my goal here. Uh, don't want to own any, any vegans epic style or anything like that. We're not, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not debunking, we're not debunking vegan fallacies. Nor are we arguing in favour of veganism or carnism, either, either one, you know. I'm, I'm uh, just giving my thoughts because, um, I don't know, I've just been thinking about it lately. Because I saw there's this website called um, xxiivv.com, is it .com? Let's find out, shall we? Uh, yeah, x wiki dot x x i i v v dot com, basically, uh, and they have a page on veganism, and I was thinking like, how could these people who made this website, who seem fairly reasonable, <laughs> write this page? Not that the not that the veganism itself is the problem, it's the way that they chose to talk about it that made it strange, because what they did was they made a big um. Uh, like a table, right? A two two column table. Where on one side was like straw man arguments against veganism, and on the other side, their arguments against the the, per the people they just made up. And um, turns out it's quite easy to argue against people that you just made up. Uh, so um, I was just interested about, and also, what's interesting is, like the the arguments that they made seemed incompatible with other parts of their ideology it was very strange um but so that's one thing i was thinking about is like that's kind of weird right um and then another thing i was thinking about was um you know after reading a lot of the, this this wiki website thing um like we agree on most things me and me and them like i i think that they and a lot of vegans, like a lot of vegans are anarchists, for example, a lot of vegans into like, uh, you know, deep ecology and stuff like that. And uh, obviously against factory farming, which I too not a big fan of, uh, you know, we have a, a lot in common. So like, I was just thinking about like, you know, I've just sort of been thinking about it. Like, what are the actual differences? Um, I, I think, um, Hmm. There's basically three main arguments in favour of veganism, right? You've got the environmental argument, the health argument, and the moral argument. So, um, in, in order, trying to steel man each of these arguments. The first one, environmentally, um, agricultural industry uses an absurd amount of resources. Like, a, a, a lot of, it takes way more water and resources and grain to keep a, 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 a to raise cows than it does to just plant the equivalent amount, like the, an, an equivalent yield of crops. Um, and also lots of livestock produce like methane and stuff, which is pretty bad for the environment. And often um, big swaths of land, you know, it takes a lot more land to graze livestock than it does to, again, produce an equivalent yield of plant-based food, uh, which means more deforestation and stuff like that. So that's, you know, in conclusion, the uh, in the agricultural industry is bad for the environment. Plus, that's not even to mention transportation costs and, and uh, like transportation of meat across the world uh, once it's been harvested. Um, so that's that's the that's the environmental argument. I think it's by far the strongest argument. Um, the, the second argument is uh, what, what did I say? <laughs> um, I said there was an environmental uh, health and uh, moral. Uh, the health argument, I think, is the weakest. The, the health argument often is sort of predicated on a bunch of weird stuff about nutrition. Um, um, so, for example, one of the straw man arguments on the XXIV AIVV, uh, website was um, humans are supposed to eat meat because we have canines. And the argument against that was there are many herbivore her animals that that don't have can that do have canines but they don't eat meat so having canines doesn't necessarily mean we're predisposed to eat meat what we really eat the the sort of pure human diet is mostly um they they had a word for it i don't remember what it was but it was basically uh i looked it up and it meant like 
mostly eating fruits and seeds and nuts. Um, uh, now, I think it's pretty easy to argue against this. Uh, um, sort of, firstly, um, any argument that hinges on a uh, how how would I put it? Like, um, I'm I'm really not trying to like like straw man their arguments here i'm trying to to make it so that i'm i'm making reasonable points and I, again i don't want this to be like an owning of the like i don't want to be like oh you're so silly with your logical fallacies or whatever like that's not what i'm trying to do i'm trying to i'm trying to actually think through these people's thought process and understand their what where they're coming from so um uh, that's that's the argument basically is that um hu humans uh, sort of pre-agriculture and early agricultural societies ate mostly uh, seeds and nuts and if you look at similar apes to us they also don't eat as much meat as we do um, like humans eat probably way more meat than like we're, we're not really designed to eat meat uh, if you know if you biologically um, so yeah I think this is a fairly easy argument to discredit um, so the first one is that I would not go with canines as evidence that we are supposed to eat or supposed that we are biologically that we have a biological predisposition towards meat um, I would use uh, um, uh, fucking glut glutamate receptors on our tongues the, the, the taste receptors on our tongues that detect glutamates which um, there's, there's uh, like directly that uh, that's umami, by the way. The taste receptors that allow us to taste umami, uh, although umami is found in some plants like uh, seaweeds and uh, mushrooms, uh, although mushrooms aren't really plants. Um, neither of those are particularly calorie dense. Like uh, mushrooms are very not very much not calorie dense and also fairly unsafe. Uh, like just statistically, <laughs> you know, like if you eat a random mushroom you find on the ground, the chances are it won't be good. Um, again, and seaweed also, firstly, only available to a, a few people who live by the sea. Sorry, my, I'm trying to plug my phone in because uh, it's low on charge. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, and secondly, again, not very calorie dense. So you wouldn't expect us to have evolved a system for specifically detecting and enjoying foods that taste like that unless there was some reason that we wanted, you know, like, for example, we evolved to dislike overly bitter tastes because that's the taste of poison, uh, uh, right? Um, like po poisonous plants and stuff tend to taste very bitter, and so we d we evolved to dislike that taste. So that basically, it's a it's a it's a, a like a reward system thing where you you get a you get disincentivized from eating bitter things because they taste bad to your brain, and so you spit them out, and then you don't get poisoned. Um, same, whereas with glutamates, which are tend to be you know sort of concentrated around protein type of uh, foods like meats. We get a reward chemical. We get, we feel, feel it tastes nice. Um, even if you're a vegan, you think it tastes nice. You you probably like mushrooms and kombu and uh, stuff like that. I think tomatoes even have some glutamates in them. Uh, whereas none of those foods are particularly calorie dense, right? Like they're not something that you can base a whole diet on. Whereas the big food group that has lots of glutamates, even more so than those other things, and uh, is very calorie dense and you know like it's good food in a situation where there is not much food available is meat products and so it's fairly obvious from that that you can infer that uh, the human body has a reward system specifically designed to reward you for eating meat products because they are good food they have plenty of they have lots of calories available they have protein which we need to survive and so on um so i think that's a pretty like if you're talking about um sort of the environment we evolved for uh I think that's a fairly good argument that we evolved uh, an appetite for meat. But all that being said, talking about, I, I think that the entire premise of this argument is flawed, right? Like I think that that talking about it from a standpoint of what we were designed to do uh, is a is a is a is a flawed premise because we are conscious. We don't have to follow the the uh, whims of a divine creator. <laughs> you know, we can choose. Uh, willingly to um you know not do that um so you know uh 
I, I think both arguments on both sides are, are fairly poor. Um, once you once you think about that, right? Like, doesn't doesn't necessarily matter what we designed to do because we don't. Most of us don't live in that sort of environment, the uh, environment we evolved in anymore. And um, secondly, even if we did, if we found a better method, non evolutionarily but mimetically. Um, there's no reason why not to do that. So, you know, I don't think either of our, either, either argument in either direction of what we are sp supposed to do works here. Um, although I do think that if you, if you are trying to take that argument, I don't think you can argue against carnism. Uh, it's fairly obvious. Um, so, so yeah, uh, but, but then there's, there's the, like that aside, the, uh, there's the argument that it's like good for you and stuff. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not a nutritionist, but, uh, so I don't really know. I know it's possible to get your dietary needs met through veganism. Like you, you can eat enough. You can get everything you need from a plant-based diet if you really want to. So you know, sure, go ahead. I, I don't, I'm not gonna stop you. Um, the argument that meat products are actively bad for you, I'm not sure about that. Like uh, in cowspiracy, they do a big bit about how bad milk is for you, cow's milk. Um, I am very extremely suspicious of that section. Um, that scientist who, who is sort of credited, who's interviewed in that documentary, uh, is not really a very credible source. Um, so yeah, I, I, I am suspicious of this idea that meat products and dairy products and stuff like that are actively bad for you. But I think, I think um, grain-raised, um, modern, factory-farmed meat is probably not the best, injected with all sorts of antibiotics and hormones and... Um, all of this stuff, probably not the best for you, but I think um, grass-fed, like a, a good grass-fed beef or something like that, um, is probably pretty, I, 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 I struggle to see how that is um, unhealthy, at least, you know, in a reason, obviously if you're insane and you eat burgers every day, you're going to get fat, <laughs> but like, uh, insane or American, uh, but you know, you know what I'm saying, right? I feel like a slab of meat cooked on a grill with, with plenty of good fats, like with like butters and olive oil and stuff. That's like one of the healthiest meals you can have with, with vegetables and, you know, I feel like, I feel like that's good. Hey, but that's just me. Um, there's another historical based argument, which was about how our ancestors, uh, ate way less meat than we do now. Um, that was a weird one. Like, isn't this weird for weird stuff for like anarchists to be saying to appeal to? Firstly, they appeal to a natural order of things, like um, humans weren't designed to eat meat. Then they appeal to ancestral traditions. It's all a bit strange. Like that's what's fascinating to me because this is like just incompatible with the rest of how you talk about things. It's very strange. Um, but uh, that's also not true. I mean, it was true in the sort of medieval era uh, at the sort of agricultural, like pre-industrial but post-agricultural era of human history that people ate way more grains and way, way less meat, the average person. But um, pre-agriculture, that is not necessarily true. If you look at modern hunter-gatherer tribes and stuff, they, they eat plenty of meat. So it's, uh, you know, again, hard to say, really. Uh, um, I think it's... it's and also it's... It, um, it also depends on where you live, like it's, it's highly uh, geographic, so um, if you live in a place where the ground isn't particularly fertile for crops, like, like grains and stuff, uh, um, then you're not going to be able to grow enough to sustain yourself and you're going to have to rely on meat. If you live in a place that has extremely fertile ground with crops, you can probably afford, you know, and so on and so on. There's a whole bunch of stuff, like, um, uh, like, you know, it's all, it's all, it's all a bit, uh, stuff. It's all, it's all a, a, a lot of variables. Um, like, uh, if, if you were made in a, let's say medieval Europe, because that, or, you know, actually pretty much anywhere, it, it doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, maybe if you live, uh, in the middle of the country, then you, you might not eat that much. Um, maybe if you live in sort of a, an, in a more, heavily populated place where there aren't enough space for massive farms and stuff maybe you eat more more plant-based food but if you live in a if you live in right next to a, a stream or a river with plenty of fishing 
I'm I'm sure that they would have eaten fish, a lot of fish. In fact, I, I know they would have eaten a lot of fish. Or by the seaside, would have eaten probably a lot of fish. Um, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of sort of factors that go into it. You can't really just blanket say people ate less meat back then. I mean, some people ate less meat, some people ate more meat. Uh, there's also stuff to take into account, like re religious traditions. So, you know, certain Buddhists don't eat meat. Certain people, like uh, Jew uh, Jews and Muslims, don't eat pork. So if you go there and study the pork consumption in that area, and you, you know, there's like a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, but uh, uh, either way, I don't think appealing to feudalism as the peak of human society is a good argument. And also... I would be way happier if people still raised the majority of animals in the way that they were raised in the medieval era. You know, it's a they probably had much better quality meat back then. Like the stuff that peasants were eating, meat-wise, was probably as good as the really expensive meat that you can buy now. So, from a historical slash biological uh, or, or like nutritional standpoint. I think I think it's hard to make any grand statements either way. Is my my conclusion on that? I I don't think it, you can necessarily make an argument in favor of meat eating from based on historical um, evidence and nutritional evidence because, as I said before, it seems to be fairly possible to eat a healthy diet entirely vegan, and um, you know it, it's not a blanket. People in the past ate loads of meat, or people in the past didn't eat loads of meat, and they were fine. Also, it depends about what you mean by the past, because are you talking pre-agricultural, early agriculture, medieval period, etc. The big differences in people's diets, both region to region and time period to time period, um, and even season to season. Uh, that's also a big factor. People ate a lot seasonally. Um, so, yeah. Um, my conclusion is you, you can't really make any good, ar strong argument in either direction based on that uh, available evidence. Um, the only argument you can make is it's possible to live healthily with a vegan diet. Um, wh whether it's more or less healthy is up for debate, uh, in my opinion. Um, uh, so, th uh, the th the final argument was the moral argument, and this is this is the one that um, maybe is most interesting because it is fairly legitimate in in that. Um, the, the meat industry is, a, 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 the current modern meat industry is pretty plainly um, morally bad, right? Like if you, if you actually see the conditions that animals are treated, and even if you don't just care about animals, you know, even if you care about humans, um, the meat industry employs a lot of um, very low wage um, immigrant workforce um, who are treated very badly and they have high rates of like PTSD and uh, they, they imagine your job is you stand in the same place just murdering animals every day, like that's gonna have a pretty fucked up psychological consequences on you, I imagine. Um, now this is this is, a, yeah, I'm I'm not happy with that either. <laughs> I don't think anyone is, um, but I I think uh, to take that and then apply it to uh, the sort of a animal husbandry type of um, society. I think is a bit of a stretch, you know, I, like I, I do generally don't see stuff like that with people who raise their own animals on a big farm in a more traditional way with uh, in a more ecologically friendly way, generally not uh, how I see it. And I definitely do not see it with hunters. Uh, they don't tend to be sort of traumatized in the same way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, more of a problem like it's a, it's definitely a problem with the modern meat industry and if you if you you know that's a that's a that's a legitimate that's legitimate but um in terms of like the human side of things i'm talking but i don't know if you can argue that same case against meat consumption in general like that seems like more of a uh reform type of thing than an abolition type of thing uh okay but here's the, the kicker, right, is obviously the main big thrust of a vegan argument is always um, animals have the feelings too, we shouldn't kill them. If we, if we have an alternative that doesn't involve harming animals, then we, should have, we shouldn't harm animals because that's morally wrong. Um, 
so the first thing I want to say is I'm not particularly interested in being the most moral person around, you know, just never been that interesting to me. Um, if you are someone that cares about that, then go ahead. But even if you are, I think there are some, um, you know, uh, discrepancies in, in this, this line of thought. Um, so the, the first one being one of the questions I ask vegans when I, when I, when I know them is whether or not they eat mollusks. So, you know, clams, um, mussels, uh, these, these sorts of things, creatures. Uh, the reason being that mollusks, mollusks are in extremely simple life forms, more simple than many plants. In fact, they are, they don't have a central nervous system. They don't have a, anything even close to a brain. They are still classified as animals, but they are some of the simplest, simplest animal life forms out there, right? Whereas, compare that to uh, mushrooms, right? Mycelial networks are extremely complex and extremely advanced. And uh, as more and more evidence comes to light, it seems that uh, mushroom intelligence is a legitimate, you know, field of research. Um, uh, and, and not just that, there are, there are other signs of sort of plant intelligence. So, for example, uh, tr trees, right? Uh, you know, I, I see how it's very compelling to look at a pig being slaughtered and hear it sort of screaming and empathize with that pig, right? That's a very natural human thing to do. So when you cut down a tree, the tree releases pheromones, and the purpose of those pheromones is to warn other trees in the sort of neighborhood that there's some, there's some danger here, I'm, I'm being killed, right? Is that not the same purpose as a scream? Is that not just a, a scream in a different language? Because trees don't have mouths, but they can produce pheromones and chemicals to communicate with other trees. Um, so to me, that is the same thing as a scream, but because it's in a language we can't understand, um, we don't empathize with it. So I think this comes more to just a human perspective thing. Like, oh, we have ears that can understand the squeal, squeal of a pig as a, a, a cry in anguish, but we don't have the ability to sense the scream of a dying tree. So we don't empathize with the tree. Um, and if you think that's an oversimplification, uh, trees have very complex communication systems, um, partly in combination and in symbiosis with mycelial networks, which often live underneath the roots of, of forests and uh, help aid with plant communication, sort of like the internet. Um, uh, so, you know, cutting off a mushroom is and eating it is, you know, the mushroom grows back, but... Um, under, most of the plant is underneath this, the earth in these form of mycelium. It's it's kind of like just cutting off a, 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 like a penis, because that's what the mush, it's the reproductive organ, the, right? So it's, it's like you cut off the penis of an animal and eat it, and then say it doesn't cause any harm because the penis grows back. Well, I think that would cause harm. Um, or, you know, eat, eating plants, they, they just can't communicate in the same language as us, but they still have responses to stimuli um and so yeah you know like as i was going to say trees like for example they have specific pheromones that they might give off to uh like um so let's say the one has an infestation of caterpillars it gives off a specific pheromone to warn the neighboring trees hey there's there's fucking caterpillars on me so it clearly has some way of sensing the environment and then um adapting to its environment and communicating uh, these these are like the factors for um, uh, cognition, cognition, right? And then the other trees in the vicinity can detect that pheromone and they will start producing within them uh, chemicals which ward off caterpillars. Um, so they have a whole communication network and clearly they have uh, the ability to interpret and adapt to their environment. Not only that, but of course there's basic stuff like they can grow towards the light and stuff like that, right? Um... So, you know, plants are fairly intelligent. In fact, uh, lots of things without brains are fairly intelligent. Slime molds don't have anything resembling a nervous system or brain or anything, and yet they are able to be fairly intelligent systems. Um, uh, and, of course, mushrooms, probably fairly intelligent systems. Um, and so the idea that you don't eat mollusks because they're in the kingdom Animalia, even though they are far, far more simple creatures uh, than 
many different types of plants that you will eat and mushrooms, fungi, which you will eat, this seems a bit hypocritical to me. It's, it seems a bit strange. I feel like if you really wanted to expand this ideology, you would just never eat <laughs> because, the uh, you know, and even if you say, well, I actually do eat mollusks, um, then, you know, the question is, where do you draw the line? It's just arbitrary. You know, we draw our meat eaters draw an arbitrary line, too. We only eat animals that are most useful to us as food. We don't eat dogs or horses. Some people eat horses but and some people eat dogs. Most people don't eat dogs, horses, cats and other animals like that because they are more useful in other circumstances, you know, or historically they were. Like cats are more useful uh, to ward off pests, pest animals from eating your crops than they are um, for eating. They, uh, and... Um, uh, fucking dogs are more useful for hunting and stuff like that and companionship than they are for food and uh, horses are more useful for transportation than they are for eating Gem so generally speaking we have a you know we have our reasons too <laughs> we, at least historically speaking as to why we draw a specific line in a specific place um, and, and also the animals that we do eat tend to be the ones that are the most useful you know like um like, you know, we don't just get one, it's not, it, it would be a pretty poor animal if all you could do was spend all of these resources on it just to get one dead animal out of it at the end, which won't even last for your refrigeration for that long. Um, so we generally cultivate livestock that have other uses, like chickens produce eggs regularly, um, cows and sheep and goats produce milk regularly and stuff like this, right? So basically my point being, even if you want to take the moral stance, I, I, I feel like this is just a... Sh what it actually shows is the arbitrariness of morality in general. And rather than really being a, a, a solid argument in favour of veganism, um, I think it's a fairly solid argument and against the modern industrial meat industry, but I don't think it's a fairly... I don't think it's a particularly good argument in terms of veganism. Um, and yeah, when it comes to environmentalism, I don't think I made a counter argument to that. When it comes to environmentalism, um, again, it's a good argument against the modern meat industry. I don't think it's a good argument against um, animal husbandry in general. Um, because, uh, you know, one of the reasons that the meat industry is, consumes so many resources, as is one of the biggest hinges on the, the environmental argument, is that we feed them grains because we got really, really good at feeding, at growing grains, because we like them, and so we got really, really good at it. Uh, but in the past, that was not what these animals were fed. They were fed on foods that we couldn't eat and that we had plenty of, like like grass, for example. You know, uh, we can't eat grass, and so we hire these animals to turn the, the, the grass into milk, which is something we can eat. They're basically machines designed to do that. Um, and uh, also, milk is, milk is the only food that is designed to be food. Uh, I don't know if you ever thought about that, but but most other foods aren't designed to be food. Milk is designed to be food, uh, and so it's really good. Love milk. Shout out to milk, specifically cheese and yogurt and kefir and all these fermented milk stuff, because fermentation is actual magic godliness on earth. It's it's the actual essence of holy and sacred esoteric, all of the buzzwords. It's all of that. That's All of it culminates in fermentation, um, and it's really good for you, and you you got to love it. So um, yeah, those those are my thoughts on veganism. I, I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting ideology, for sure.